We've had very, two very stimulating talks, brethren and sisters, on the signs of the times. But what I'm going to talk about is the signs of the times in Australia. And Jesus said, what I say to everybody, I say to you. Watch. Brothers and sisters, there wouldn't be a brother or a sister here who wouldn't agree with me when I say that we have never, ever, ever seen a world like we see today. You have never seen a world like we've in. The signs of the times are everywhere. They're not only in Russia. They're not only in Israel. They are worldwide, brothers and sisters, and they are watching on this shore. And we've got to keep our wits about us, our spiritual wits, brothers and sisters, because we're going to be under challenge, I think, in many ways. And yet we've got this consolation. We know what it's all about. The world is in desperate trouble, desperate trouble. And we know what it's all about. And I'll tell you what it's all about. It's for his son. It's for the glory of his son. It's a long overdue reward that's going to come to him, brothers and sisters, because of what he's done for the humanity, for his wonderful life and his tremendous sacrifice, taking the insults of the world upon himself that we might be saved. It's all about that. It's all about God's glory. And when he steps into the world, brothers and sisters, the world will be aghast and they will bow their heads first in shame and then in thank and thankfulness for this man, brothers and sisters, of whom it is said, the government shall be upon his shoulder. There'll be no senates, House of Representatives, House of Commons, anything of that like, committees, whatever. The government shall be upon his shoulder. End of the matter. And what a glorious day that is. I dream about it, brothers and sisters. I pray about it. I want to be in that kingdom. I want to see that done. Because it'll be one of the most magnificent things we've ever seen. We'll never see anything like it. And brothers and sisters, the sun is over the horizon almost. We can almost see the tip of it, can't we? And we wait with extreme excitement for that day, if not with a little fear, because we're going to face divinity. Ever thought about that? I've got a vivid imagination, you know that, and I frighten myself to death when I think about what's ahead of us. But brothers and sisters, we're longing for that, for that, that to be said unto us, fear not, fear not, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Well, this is the world we live in, brothers and sisters. Yahweh of armies, behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. And a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Have a look at these whirlwinds, brothers and sisters. Look, south, see the, the continent of Africa. See where that arrow is? Ebola is raging in that area. Ebola. And it's killed over 1,500 people already. And even the aid workers are terrified to go into the hospitals because of that. This is rampant, brothers and sisters, there. And just north of where that arrow is getting up to Nigeria and Libya. The, Isla the Islamic extremists are on the march, brothers and sisters, and they are mass murderers. They're madmen. They're clean madmen. They take young girls from their colleges, over a hundred of them, and whisk them off into nowhere. And to do your imagination, no good to think about what happened to those little girls. These are madmen, brothers and sisters, and they're, they're loose in that continent. You go a bit to the right, to the Sudan, North and South Sudan are be at loggerheads. Southern Sudan is a bit desert. Do you know what's going to happen? Do you know what they're saying? That it'll be the greatest human disaster in history coming the next harvest season because they say it's a possibility, and this is not my words, this is on the ABC News and on the BBC News, there's a possibility of 16 million people to starve to death because they haven't been able to sow their crops. That's one whirlwind. Here's another one. We've heard a lot about the Ukraine, haven't we? We don't need to speak too much about that. But that whirlwind is gathering in intensity, brothers and sisters, because it's pulling two ways. And the Ukrainian president wants to go to the west, and Russia wants him to come east. He wants to go to the U European market, and Putin does not want him in the European market. And Ukraine, Kiev especially, 
Brothers and sisters, as Brother John King pointed out, is the vortex of that whirlwind. And it was there that the Russian Empire was born. It was born there, and as one the writer, the writer said in an early Australian paper here, he once said this, that Sputin has an undisguised dream. And he says the, the uh, occupation of Kiev in particular is key to that dream. Why? Because the Russian Empire, he just doesn't want a, Rus a Russian Empire, he wants the ancient Russian Empire. It was born in Kiev, and the princes were called the princes of Rus. Oh, you say, we know about that. We know about Ezekiel 38. Brethren and sisters, we suggest talk about Rus, and it's a word, of course, for the ancient Russians. But Ezekiel got the title right. The exact title, that was in the 1985 National Geograph. The title. And you know who one of the early ones were? Do you know the one that converted the whole of Ukraine to Christianity? His name was Vladimir. Believe that? Vladimir. And he went down in history of changing Ukraine completely to Christianity. He baptised tens of thousands of people standing in the Dnieper River, standing in the water. He put them all in the water and baptised them into the Christian faith. And as Brother John rightly pointed out, Putin is a Christian. And he has an undisguised dream. And his name's Vladimir. Do you know what Vladimir means? This was in the Reader's Digest. Vladimir means ruler of the world. So here's a man that wants to be ruler of the world. He's Vladimir. He's the man that's going to convert people to Christianity. And when, part, when that dream, of course, is tied in with the work of the Pope, brothers and sisters, the great enemies of Christianity, not only Islam, but Israel. The murderers of Jesus Christ. Can you see the scenario building up, brothers and sisters? Well, that's the whirlwind that's going on there. Of course, you know about that whirlwind, don't you? In that area, Iraq and Iran and Syria, with the IS, the Islamic State. And here we've got a man who says he's the successor. to this. He's going to be the leader of this caliph. And when you talk about Sunnis and Shiites, you're talking about the major divisions in the Muslim world, brothers and sisters. You know how it came to pass? came to pass back in the 600s AD when, when uh, Muhammad had died. It was said in the Quran that the nearest blood relation to him must be the, the, the caliph. He must be. The nearest one to him must be the caliph. There were two with the nearest blood to Muhammad. And that's how Sunni and Shiite division have come up. And whether they're called today the Al Qaeda or ISIS or Boko Roman or whatever they call them, brothers and sisters. They're either Sunnis and they're either Shiites, but they're not all extremists. And so we've got a, a situation building up. And how is the world going to answer that? Do you know that that ISIS state, which is now in, straddles Iraq and Syria, is the size of Great Britain and France put together? And brothers and sisters, can you imagine the problem the world's going to have with that? You listen to your radio. Don't, never mind what's going on in the Middle East. Just listen to what's happening here. You see, he, he, Tony Abbott's rushing across to talk to him in England about it. John Kerry's coming from the United States to talk to Australia. About it. Diplomats are running all over. Heads of nations are running all over. What are we going to do? Who's going to control this problem? From Morocco on the western coast of Africa right over to Indonesia is the, is the Islamic belt. 1.2 billion people and the most densely populated of all the Islamic countries is 400 k's from Australia, Indonesia. Oh, they may not be hostile, but they're Islamists. They follow the Quran. And here comes another whirlwind. All over the world, God is raising up whirlwinds. Tremendous, tremendous signs, brothers and sisters. Japan has sent out threatening words against China. Who's going to pick on China? Their population equals the population of the Muslims, 1.2 billion. They're a powerful nation. Japan had said after the Second World War, we will never rearm. They are rearming. They rate, brothers and sisters, the seventh, seventh, strongest army in the world. 
Think about that. That includes, of course, all the mechanisation, Air Force and everything. The seventh. But they said they wouldn't do it. They're the seventh. And they're saying to China, stop pinching islands off of us. Stop doing this. And all the Asian countries, you listen to them. You just listen to your news. They're shivering in their boots. Because if that erupts, brothers and sisters, then we're going to find very, very difficult times here in this country as well as the world. And we're the lucky country. We're lucky. That's the nickname that this country's got. If you don't think we're lucky, ask all those boat people that risk their lives in, ris ris in, in, in risky boats coming across the Indian Ocean. Why do they want to come here? Everybody wants to come to Australia. We're the lucky country. Well, brothers and sisters, how lucky are we? You know something about Ezekiel 38 and 39? Do you know that verse? I will send a fire on Mago, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I'm Yahweh. This is how the ESV, or Young's Literal Translation, puts it. I will send a fire on Mago and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know I am Yahweh. Dwelling carelessly in the isles, brothers and sisters, is a classic description of the Australian society. When we go home tonight, what everybody wants to know when they turn their tellies on or the radio or whatever is who won the footy. That's what they want to know. Who's in the eight? And on and on we go in this country, brothers and sisters, living as if there's no tomorrow. Well, there is a tomorrow. And brothers and sisters, there's a nice little doctrine which we've adopted for years and it's partially true, I suppose that we'll be taken out of it. Yes, we will. Isaiah the prophet says that, doesn't he? Come and hide thyselves, but for a moment, for a little while. Of course we'll be taken out of it, brothers and sisters. But listen, Jesus said this, the same day that Noah entered the ark, the flood came. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven. How much of that day we will see, brothers and sisters, is anyone's guess. But I don't think that in the overall plan and purpose of God as he develops his people, that anyone's going to get an armchair ride into that kingdom. People my age don't have too much to worry about it, do we? Because we'll probably be here and gone tomorrow. Who knows? But I've got children. I've got grandchildren, and I've got great-grandchildren, and I'm sick with worry that if the Lord does not come, what sort of a world is our children going to face? What's all the kids going to do that meet in this place, happily now, singing their little songs, entertaining their mums and dads and grandma and grandpas? What are they going to do, brothers and sisters? If everything tumbles around us, and it is tumbling around us, you cannot listen to any news broadcast on the ABC that does not mention the loss of jobs. Just about every broadcast you hear, so many jobs gone there, so many jobs gone here, so many jobs gone there, and we borrow a billion dollars a day to pay the interest on the debt of this country. How long do you think that's going to last? Brothers and sisters, it is time to watch. Our eyes are on the Middle East all the time. They're on Russia all the time. Just get them a bit lower and look down at your feet. Have a look around you at what's happening right under your nose. And the signs are clear, brothers and sisters. We are not, just not, going to get an armchair ride into that kingdom. And what do we watch for? keeping your garments. So garments have a significance, don't they? That one, of course, spiritually talks about our baptism into Christ. We put him on, says Galatians. It was white. 
pure white. And as long as we remain in that garment, brothers and sisters, despite the fact that we'll never be perfect and we'll commit our sins, but if we don't want to do it, we do it against our will, we pray for it, that garment will forgive us. The Lord Jesus Christ will not see any blemishes in our garment because his is white. That's all that matters. He represents all of us, doesn't he? Time, brothers and sisters, to go to your cupboard, your spiritual cupboard, have a look at your life, have a look inwardly. What your garments look like? Are we keeping them? Are we watching them? That really doesn't apply to us, does it? Who endures afflictions? But be warned. They're talking about sending troops. They're discussing it. They're not, they're not putting anything in paper, on paper. Or oh, we won't say we'll send troops over there to, to resist this ISIS group that's beginning to spread around the Middle Eastern world. We, we won't do that. But if they do, if they do, brothers and sisters, then all our young men are going to be called up for military service and their young women. And I believe that if the situation deteriorates any further, when it's like oh, all the people who know about these sort of things, they talk about the strategies of it, if there's no boots on the ground, there's no way that we're going to hold back the tide of these maniac Islamist extremists who cut people's heads off, crucify them and whatever. And our young men might have to stand up and answer for what they believe. We've got to watch and endure afflictions. And there's others to come that will affect not only your young people, but the elderly as well. Watch and stand fast. What Paul is telling the Corinthians, brothers and sisters, is this. See me standing here? He says, don't go that way and don't go that way. Stand here. And today, of course, is the day of novelties. It's the day of change. It's the day of humanism. All that really matters is you don't offend people. Morals don't count anymore. Just don't offend anybody. And we curse humanism, don't we? It is a curse, an absolute curse. And brothers and sisters, I'm sad to say, when you hear some of the controversies spoken of among the brother, in the brotherhood, we feel that some people practice it. Don't move, just stand right where you are. In the truth, solidly based upon the work of the pioneers, who are as modern as anyone could be modern, they're more modern than your newspaper because they see past it. Don't move that way and don't move this way. Watch that. Remember, Acts 20 and verse 31. Watch and remember. Remember what? Well, brothers and sisters, I was baptised at the age of 22. Been over 60 years in the truth. And I remember wonderful times. We think back with all the troubles that we may have had and had to circumvent. It never, it never diminished, did it, brothers and sisters, the power of the truth. And we can look back over the years and we can see our children growing up and coming to the waters of baptism and proceeding on from there to becoming responsible, useful members in the ecclesia. Remember that. Remember it. Watch that. Because we don't want irresponsibility. We don't want people who think that they're outdated, the, the pioneers. We don't want that. We just want to stay where we are. And we want to remember that. Just watch. And this is not just me saying it to you because I'm giving a talk. I'm telling you, just watch. You're in your ecclesia. You are all a member's ecclesia somewhere. Just keep your ears and eyes open and just kindly and firmly keep your ecclesia the best that you possibly can, staying where they are. Improving, of course, all the time. But improve is to stand fast because you won't better the truth. But you need to stand there, brothers and sisters. And above all else, brothers and sisters, watch and pray. Do we pray? Well, we all know that we are deficient in that respect. I think we'll all admit that. Some people are more alert than others. But I think now, 
for the last few years at least, I pray while I'm walking around the house because I want him to come, brothers and sisters. I desperately want that, not just for me. I can see what's going to happen. It's sticking out like a mile. You, you, you know it's going to happen. We're just not going to drift along like we've been drifting along. And you pray earnestly, Father, please send him. And when we finish this talk, brothers and sisters, we've selected a hymn. I want that hymn to be a prayer, as it is a prayer. Don't get up and just sing it as a hymn when we sing it. Just pray, just, let's pray together in song at the end of this, this day for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things, brothers and sisters, that we've got to be doing. Now, Isaiah 24. You know, brothers and sisters, Isaiah 24 has at least four major, if not more, allusions to the, prophet, to the, the Olivet Prophecy. Isn't that interesting? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the Olivet Prophecy. Up until the apocalypse, the greatest prophecy ever given on earth. You know how many people heard it? You know how many people heard the Olivet Prophecy? Four. Four. Peter and Andrew, brothers. James and John, brothers. And in that prophecy, the Lord said this, brother shall betray brother to death. Now, he didn't believe that Peter was going to do, or Andrew were going to turn on each other or James and John. But families did. That's in the Olivet Prophecy. And there are at least four allusions out of this chapter we read today from the Olivet Prophecy. Here they are. The earth shall rule to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Take heed to yourselves. This is Luke. This is Luke. Take heed to yourselves. Let at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfing and drunkenness and the cares of this life and shall it come upon you unawares. Fear and the pit and the snare, says Isaiah, are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. Or as a snare shall it come upon all them to dwell upon the face of the whole earth. That's a clear allusion to, to the Olivet Prophecy, isn't it? The earth shall be utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Now in the Septuagint translation of that, that I can't pronounce that Greek word, but it means completely perplexed. Here it is in the Olivet Prophecy. There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. And if you look at the Greek word at the bottom, you'll see that's relationship to the one up at the top. And the earth is perplexed, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Absolutely perplexed. Then shall the moon be confounded and the sun ashamed when Yahweh shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. So here is the Lord, as he spoke that prophecy, as he was in many parts of the Bible, but he was certainly in Isaiah 24. And we got, we got a doctrine now which says the Olivet Prophecy had nothing to do with the future. It's all fulfilled in AD 70. Well, I'll tell you something, Isaiah 24 doesn't say that. Isaiah talks about a time, brothers and sisters, we just read it, when the whole of this world is going to be embroiled. As a matter of fact, Yahweh is going to pick the world up and turn it upside down. The whole world is going to turn upside down. This is what this prophecy tells us. Now look at the first verse of, of, of Isaiah 24. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it way and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. So the earth, brothers and sisters, is going to be turned upside down. I want to show you what he intends to do. When you turn a thing upside down... Nobody falls on their feet. You collapse in a heap, don't you? It's a crisis that nobody is going to escape. And how much we're going to be embroiled in that crisis, we don't know. But I don't think we're just going to be wafted off out of it, having lived a glorious life in this country, in the lucky country, I don't think that in the economy of God that we're going to be so blessed to see none of those problems. 
And when they come, no one will escape. This is what Yahweh means. Because you see, in all crises, whatever they are, earthquake will kill some people and some people will escape. Well, nobody escapes this. So Isaiah says, religiously, this is verse 2, people and priest. It shall be with the people as with the priest. We're all in it. Industrially, as with the servant, so with his master. BHP will suffer, so will the unions. Nobody will get out of this. Domestically, the maid and her mistress. Even in the household situation, Yahweh will turn the world upside down. The mistress owns the place. She's the boss. The maid serves the mills and scrubs the floors. Both of them will be in the problem. Commercially, buyer and seller. You know, brothers and sisters, even in a tremendous crash, financial crisis, even in the greatest of them, somebody makes a profit. Somebody in the background, clever enough to see what's coming, will be clever enough, brothers and sisters, to do things to ensure that they at least get out of it with something. Well, nobody will. And you listen to your news. Just listen to it about the financial crisis of the world, and we're one of the lucky countries, but we are heavily in debt, brothers and sisters. Heavily in debt. And when Yahweh turns everyone's pocket upside down, he touches the most tenderest part of our being. Money. That will be a catastrophe and a disaster, brothers and sisters, that will turn Everybody mad, and no one will escape. That's the message here that we're getting. Financially, of course, you could that this is the lender and the borrower. Well, someone makes a profit, don't they, uh, with, the, with those financial institutions? But no, this time, nobody does. See what he's saying? And we say, we'll talk about investments, taker and giver. And the, the Hebrew word, at the end of this verse, the Hebrew word is really based upon that idea of investment. And how many of the brethren and sisters sitting in this audience watch the stock exchange with bated breath and beating hearts? How many do that? What's going up and what's coming down? The whole world turns into a panic when, of course, the stock exchange falls, Wall Street comes tumbling down, everybody panics. And nobody's going to make a profit out of this one. That's what Yahweh is telling us, brothers and sisters. It's clear and unmistakable here. Now, why is all this? Why is it? Well, he says in verse 3, he says, Look, the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for Yahweh has spoken his word, this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do language. Why? Why, brothers and sisters? Here's the reason why. The earth is also defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. So we got laws which turn around, they change them. We got laws they make about people's relationship with people, which under the law of Moses God called an abomination. And in the New Testament, Paul called it vile affections. And today, it's an offence to criticise some of the most filthy and vile affections you could ever imagine. And if it stirs your blood and my blood, can you imagine what it does in the councils of heaven? And we marvel, brothers and sisters, that our almighty God does not press the button. We marvel. The one who has all power in heaven and earth, invested in his son now, has got the ability to turn this world upside down. And we marvel at his patience. And we hear things on the radio that 
is so difficult to listen to. You, don't, you just don't want to go on listening anymore. And they've changed the everlasting covenant. Do you know, brothers and sisters, the everlasting covenant is a comprehensive term, of course, speaks about the divine purpose overall. Do you know how many times it's found in the Old Testament? Fourteen. Twice seven. As if Yahweh stamped that through his book. Twice seven. And they think that they can change God's purpose. Can't do that. And do you know how many times it's found in the New Testament? The everlasting covenant. Just once. He's brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Just once. And he needs to say it once now because it's all incorporated in that shepherd. And these people all over the world have broken that. And we live in a society, brothers and sisters, that is sick. It, it is diseased to the head to the foot. It's rotten to the core. And our children rub shoulders. Not here at the school, but other places they do. In the workplace, our brethren rub shoulders. The sisters go down the shops, they rub shoulders with it everywhere, it, all over the place. And the sickening sights that you see, brothers and sisters, and the sickening things that you hear, and the stupidity of our governments in the laws that they make and don't make, just make you yearn and long for that glorious and great day when he comes who's right at his. And it is his right, brothers and sisters. We, we haven't got rights to put anyone right in that sense. It belongs to him because he did no wrong. He harmed nobody. Never deviated from believing in his father. He was always constant in prayer. And he had a single-minded purpose to prove his father right and to save humanity. And he died to say, my father is right to put this nature to, to death. And the father raised him to say, it's the son's right to judge the world because he never practiced anything of that nature's inclinations. And that's what it's all, all about, brothers and sisters. And we're looking for that glorious day when all that will happen. It, it will just be the, the most magnificent thing that ever happened. And then we read in, in verse 6 of this chapter, the, the, so it says here, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few are left. Well, that's Zechariah, isn't it? Zechariah said that. And Zechariah in that 14th chapter, of course, is talking about the day when the kingdom will be established. And it's talking about the day when the day of the Lord cometh and Jerusalem shall be divided and the Russian hordes, of course, will go on their slaughtering way until they're put to, to rout and that some of the Judah will be saved, as we've been told today. Then it goes on to say that it shall come to pass that everyone that is left, how many will be left? When Yahweh turns this world upside down, how many, brothers and sisters? Who knows? But my word, won't that be a fearful day? A fearful day. And they'll go out from year to year to worship the king and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, third of the Jewish feasts, Passover celebrated the barley harvest, Pentecost celebrated the wheat harvest. What did Pentecost celebrate? The end of all the harvests. The barley, the wheat and the fruits of the ground, everything else and finishing up with the vineyard. All the harvest has been come in, brothers and sisters, and the kingdom is established, and the nation shall go from year to year. And because God regulates the, the seasons by the revolutions, of course, of, of the earth and, and the position of the sun, you're going to find a constant stream of people streaming through Jerusalem all the time. For when we're ploughing here in Australia, they're reaping in England, so there'll be nations going year in and year out, around and around, a constant stream of people going through Jerusalem at the happiest time of the year. But only few will be left to enjoy that. Oh, brothers and sisters, these verses, chapter 7 and 13, the end of drunken revelries. This, of course, the Revised Standard Version. The wine mauds, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the timbrels is still, and the noise of the jubilant have ceased. The mirth of the lyre is stilled. No more do they drink wine with singing. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. 
The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no man can enter. There is an outcry in the streets for the lack of wine. All joy has reached its eventide. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. For thus shall it be in the midst of the earth among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten, just an olive tree is shaken, very few olives hang on the branches. The vineyard, when the vineyard, the gleaning is finished, and they go through and make sure you make a big profit, you get every grape you can, there's just a few little ones hanging on the vine. This is the message, brothers and sisters, in Isaiah 24, and echoed by the Lord here. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Here's Weymouth's translation. Take heed to yourselves, lest your souls be weighed down with self-indulgence and drunkenness or anxieties of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a falling trap. What's your plans for the summertime, brothers and sisters? What's on the top of your list? What's on the top of my list? I'm, not, I'm in this. Well, you. We're all, we're all in this. What's on the top of our list for the summertime? A cruise overseas? I've been on a cruise overseas. What else? Holidays here? Holidays there? Come the time, brothers and sisters, of holidays, the ecclesial hall's half empty. Take heed to yourselves. Self-indulgence is the name of the game in Australia, the lucky country. We are a blessed country and we're blessed in the truth. There's a lot of lucky people at the moment going to become very unlucky. If I read anything else in the Bible, brothers and sisters, I read that no one is going to escape. Yahweh's going to turn this world upside down. And we need, brothers and sisters, to be there in that day. Now look at verse 10. The city of confusion. You know what that word means? It simply means, brothers and sisters, chaos. Do you know where it's found? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. And the earth was without form. That's the word here in, in this prophecy. So what is that telling us? Well, you think about it. If you were the king of the world, the king of the earth, and you were given the right to change this world, what would you do? How would you change it? How would you improve society, brothers and sisters, for the betterment of mankind? What would you do? Well, Yahweh is the king of the world. He's the king of the universe. And he's going to start again from the bottom. The earth's going to be like it was when he created it, without form. That's the difference of this age and the one to come. It's as different as that. Just as different as that. Here was the earth out there, clothed in water, darkness, utter chaos, empty, without form. And God said, and it happened. And God said, and something else happened. And God said, when Jesus comes, brothers and sisters, it won't be literal, of course. He's not going to pick up this, this earth bodily, though there will be a tremendous shaking, but he will clean it out. He, there won't be a discussion about what sort of a method we'll take to, to redeem the present situation. There will be no present situation. There will be none of it left, not one shred of it left on the earth. And he will start again. And I, I dare to say, I'll be absolutely astonished if we find, brothers and sisters, teenagers walking down the street like that and falling down the steps because they can't take their eye off the mobile phone. There'll be no mobile phones. Imagine that. What does that mean in your life? What does it mean in anyone's life? What about all the gadgets? What about all the people that are, that are caught up in that like, like a disease? It's, it's like a disease. They cannot leave it alone. They're absolutely fascinated by it. 
You can't get people's attention. Why? We've even got the daily readings on the phone now. Oh, you say, it's handy. Well, it is. But brothers and sisters, it doesn't, it does not do the soul good. Stand fast. We, we need to stop before we get in this mad circle that's enveloping our whole nation. Our brotherhood gets entangled in these things. We've got to stop that, brothers and sisters, and start living as if tomorrow is the kingdom of God. Now let's come to verse, verse 14 and onwards, then to verse 14 to 16. Now what do we find here? We find verse, in verse 14, there's going to come a cry from the sea. That's from the west. In verse 15, there's going to come a, a, somebody say, glorify Yahweh in the fires. And that word fires means from the east. So from the east to the west, brothers and sisters. Cry is going to come. The cry is coming now from everywhere, from the east and the west, for Yahweh to do something about this. As Malachi says, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, east and the west, my name shall be great among the nations. That's what Malachi says, doesn't he? Well, here is that cry going up, brothers and sisters. It's growing up and it's, com it's coming from the east and the west and they all want the Lord God of Israel in verse 15. They all want the Lord God of Israel, brothers and sisters. They want him to do something about this world. The Lord God of Israel. You know, brothers and sisters, we should be a thankful people for everything we have in life. Do you know one of the greatest things I'm thankful for? I never cease to thank God for it. I thank God nearly every night of my life. I thank him for Israel. You know that Israel, brothers and sisters, is the only tangible proof. I say tangible in the sense of something you can go and touch it if you want to. You can get on a plane and you put your feet there and there's Jews in that land. It's the most wonderful thing that God has ever done in our lifetime to give us that. That we can hang on and say when all else fails, I just say to myself, Israel... And here's people from the east and the west coming and saying to the Lord God of Israel, he's real. And there is the living proof, a nation that's disobedient, proud and arrogant brothers and sisters, has not repented of their deeds against the Son of God, but they're Abraham's seed and they will change. And you know, one of the most glorious visions of the kingdom, I just pray I'll be in that kingdom because this is what I want to see. I want to see a lot of things. But this is one I want to see. Can you imagine this? That when we read in Zechariah chapter 8, that if people want to go and see the king, who's the new king? Who is he? Who is he? Je Jesus Christ. Really? Jesus Christ. I thought he was fictitious. Jesus Christ is real. And he's the king of the world. Really? Wow, that's marvelous. I want to see him. You know how you're going to see him? How do I get there? You've got to go with a Jew. Brothers and sisters, that's genius. That is genius. If you wanted to humble all this world, you could sit for years and years and working out the best way to humble people, you won't beat that. How do I get there? You've got to go and grab hold of the coat of a Jew, not an Israelite. Zachariah doesn't say an Israelite. Not a Hebrew. No, no, no. A Jew. You spit that out, don't you? And you imagine the world humbled. It'll absolutely devastate them. And they will collapse, brothers and sisters, with that. I could not imagine a more great, greater scheme, a more ingenious scheme to humble the world than that. I want to see that. And that's what's going to happen here. People are going to say, the Lord God of Israel. And then we read on in this prophecy, brothers and sisters, you get down to these sections in the... The, uh, the days of, 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 of the morning here, you get down to the, the verse 16, the uttermost parts of the earth, and of course you read this, glory to the righteous one. Glory to the righteous one, it says, because in the, it says in the 16th verse, glory to the righteous. In the Hebrew, it's the glory to the righteous one. And I love to, to, to dwell upon that concept, brothers and sisters. Isn't it marvellous to be able to to accept that we are what we are by nature, to own up to it. And even in their best moments, what are we? But unprofitable servants. But there's one, there's one, brothers and sisters, that was totally different. And this is what the kingdom's about. And I heard the angel of the waters say, this is in Revelation, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art 
and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another angel out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And you know, brothers and sisters, that's the essence of the atonement, isn't it? It's the essence of the expression of God's character. Jesus died. People say he died for us. Yes, he did. People say he had to die for himself. Yes, he did. Brothers and sisters, first and foremost, he died for his father. Because he went up there on that cross, as Paul says, to declare God's righteousness. A nature that's prone to sin. Not sin, but prone to sin. Representing of mankind. His father imposed that, 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 that sentence on that nature. And the son's up there saying to his father, Father, you are right. He's the righteous one. And the father, having seen him go into the grave, brothers and sisters, without sin, had no other alternative. He didn't want any more alternatives. To raise his son from the dead was absolutely without a question because he'd never done any wrong. So God is right in death. God is right in life. And that's why the angels here are singing that way. And that's what we will sing, brothers and sisters, when we see the whole scheme of redemption in the world turn out to God's glory, be it in the rejection of his son or the exaltation of his son. God is right! And when we put that into practice in the ecclesias, they will prosper. And we omit that first principle, they won't prosper. And if every question that arises amongst us that causes any trouble, the first thing to say is, what does God say? And when that is settled, brothers and sisters, then, of course, we can get on with the work, of course, that is necessary in other regards. Now, I haven't got a lot of time, but look, come down with me to verse 16. Now, listen to this verse. All of a sudden, you see the paragraph mark there, because there's a different thought. This is Isaiah 24, 24, verse 16. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous one. But I said... I said, now here's Isaiah. Oh, he says, my leanness, my leanness, woe is me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very, very treacherously. Now you see what he's saying, brothers and sisters. What he's saying is this. Here's the lament of the faithful. Are you saying this? You you do you go around and you look at the things that are carrying on in the world and you hear about troubles in the brotherhood and you learn about some of the things that are done and you just you just you just say, oh. For goodness sake, what, 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 what gives? What, what can be done here? And, and, and you, you mourn for these. It's the lament of the faithful. We're all sinners. I've done things. I'd hate you to know what I've thought. I wouldn't hate anyone to know it. And you're the same. You're not going to tell us all our innermost thoughts. So none of us can put forth our boast and say, we've got, a, you know, we've got reason to say that. None of us have got any reason personally. But the, we've got this advantage that we hate the things we do wrong like Paul did. We don't want to do them. We have at least got that consolation. But it's not us, brothers and sisters, but that flesh which we bear. And when we see these things in the world let go and people do not care and glorify what they do, then, of course, it brings forth the lament of the faithful. And there's nothing new. It happened to Ezekiel as it happened to Isaiah. And Yahweh said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, Ezekiel through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men. Who are they that's going to get the mark? For those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And I'm not going to turn this chapter up, brothers and sisters, but you know what? A man came forth clothed in in, in this sackcloth and he had a a sword in his hand and there were six other men with him with the slaying swords in their hand. And Yahweh said to Ezekiel, don't worry, Ezekiel, I've got it all under control. Ezekiel's in Babylon saying this. People back in Jerusalem are the ones he's worried about. And he sees, brothers and sisters, the things that are going, or hears about it, what's going on back there, because he had messages sent to him backwards and forwards, and he knew the whole scene. And he was absolutely distraught with what the people of God were doing. The people of God's calling, God's ecclesia back in that city were abominable. And he sighed and cried. He sighed and cried about it, just like Isaiah does here. Oh, he said the treachery in this world four times. Isaiah is is decrying the treachery that is in this world. Men are betraying God and they're betraying themselves, brothers and sisters. And he he just couldn't hardly bear that. And there were six men came forth with with, with a slaying weapon in their hand. 
You know what happened when the breaches of the wall happened? When Zedekiah fled the city, the troops of of Nebuchadnezzar smashed the wall down and they raced in. And you know what happened? It's all in Jeremiah's prophecy. People ran to the middle of the square. And you know who's in the middle of the square? Six generals of Nebuchadnezzar with swords on their thighs. Standing in the middle of Jerusalem. The hour had come, brothers and sisters. The lament of the faithful. And God put a mark on their forehead. You know this verse. And I looked. A lamb stood on Mount Sinai with him and 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads, brothers and sisters. Having his father's name written in his foreheads. Well, to go on just to finish this all off, let's go back to verse 18. What's going to happen? When the Lord comes, well, the windows of heaven are going to be open. Get the end of that verse. That's what happened in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, the windows of heaven were open. And then we read, brothers and sisters, that he's going to punish the people that are on high, or rather in verse 21st, it's going to be like a cottage. People are going to be like a cottage. They're going to be staggered. It says this, verse 20, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be moved like a cottage. Now, that word for cottage really is what the Jews used. It's back in Isaiah 1. For when you, you went out to glean your field, in those days you didn't, you didn't possess hundreds of acres of land. You had a little piece here and a little piece there and a little piece there. So you'd set up a little temporary cottage for, to, to reap that field. When you left, you didn't care about it because it only made up a few branches. You left it. And, of course, that's in the, uh, at the end of the harvest time. But winter's coming on, brothers and sisters. So when you, you go on to your next piece of field, you build another little cottage. And when you move on, you build another one. And then the time comes when the wind, winds are blowing, it's cold, and the rain sweeps and the heavy winds come, and it, it'll just blow up into infinity. Here's a little picture that might help. Now, this is the earthquake. Let's go back. It should be here somewhere. No, not here. But we'll see it later on. First of all, we'll talk about this earthquake, brothers and sisters. See, it says here that there's going to be this great earthquake. The earth's going to be utterly broken down, clean dissolved. It's going to be moved exceedingly. Now, we all know about the earthquake. So that the fishes of the sea, says Ezekiel, and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the fields and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. A mountain, Mount of Olivet, about just a bit higher than Mount, Ola, the Mount Lofty, split down the middle, goes north and south for a distance 60 kilometres. Flattens everything. Zion shoots up in the air and right around it, for 60 kilometres, a perimeter, there's all the world's flat. And all over the world, brothers and sisters, every country will feel that. This will be literal. And Ezekiel says, the whole world will feel that and every wall shall fall flat to the ground. Behold, it is done, saith the Lord Yahweh. This is the day where I have spoken. Ezekiel 39 verse 8. This is the day, brothers and sisters. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven saying, It is done! What a day. And what's the cause of the earthquake? Oh, the geology will tell you about the fault line that runs from Jerusalem right down through the middle of Africa. It's not the cause of the earthquake. Two beautiful feet. When it stands on that Olivet, will split that mountain, brothers and sisters, like it's never been split. And we hope to be right with him to see that tremendous event. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Well, that little hut standing there won't stand much chance with that tornado coming up at it, will it? And that's about, that's about a good figure to illustrate, brothers and sisters, the hope of this world ever withstanding the wrath of Almighty God. And so we read that the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. The sun shall no more give her light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give her light at night. But Yahweh, shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy God 
thy glory. So morning and evening will be no longer, brothers and sisters. No more birthdays, but eternity. No need for natural light as we now know it. But in our case, brothers and sisters, we'll never be out of light. What a day. And I saw the temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. He's the light of the world, brothers and sisters. And he'll reign before his ancients glorious. That's what here in Isaiah 24 and verse 23 says, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed, when Yahweh of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Ancients. There's a few ancients in the audience. But you know, brothers and sisters, we'll all be ancients in the kingdom. All of a sudden, we'll be totally mature. Whatever age we are when Christ comes. The only description you ever read about angels in the Bible, the only sort of repeated description is this. They're clothed in white and they're young men. So we'll be young, yes, young in one sense. In another sense, brothers and sisters, we'll never be more mature in all our life than when we're in the kingdom. When all our senses will be heightened, our memories will be better, when everything we've learned and understood will become sharper and sharper, so we'll be like the ancients in Israel who got to the end of their life, had absorbed over the years the principles of God, which were now encased in human flesh and kept until they went to the grave. But here, brothers and sisters, the angels stood around about the throne, the elders, and round the elders. So the angels are there and the elders are there. Paul tells us that in Hebrews chapter 13, chapter 12. And the four living creatures... And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Oh, imagine it. I don't think we'll ever hear an Amen like it. Amen. So be it. What a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters. It'll be the last Amen, won't it? Blessing and glory and wisdom. Thanksgiving. Think of the thanksgiving we will give. Think of, think of your heart bursting with thanksgiving. What can I say to my Lord for the greatness and the reward, which is all out of proportion to what we deserve? Think of that. Honour, power and might to our God forever and ever. Amen again. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? Whence they come? And I said to him, You know. You know who they are. He said to me, these are them that have come out of great tribulation. So he addresses the elders as he said, well, who are the elders? He says, you know. My brothers and sisters, we don't know. But you know, I don't think that it's going to be true. Like a lot of people say, and it sounds very nice and it sounds very popular to say this, that we get a lot of surprises in the kingdom. Oh, yes, I think there'll be surprises. But Paul told Timothy the opposite. He told him, you'll know. Those whose work you've seen, they'll go before them. You know them, Timothy. And when he wrote to Titus, he just used just a four-letter word. When he says, let as... Obey for proper purposes. Let ours. Who's ours? Who are the ours he's talking about? Quilla, Priscilla, Silas, Barnabas, so on and so on. They were all over the world. He knew them. And the angel here, is, 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 the elders, is, uh, addressed me saying, who are these that are clothed in white robes? And he says, sir, you know. And brothers and sisters, we do know. We, we, we've seen some very wonderful people. We, we, we hope we're all wonderful people, don't we? We hope we'll all be in the kingdom. There's no guarantee we will, but we hope we will. And we don't grade people. We don't say, well, they're a wonderful person and there's not. We don't do that. That's not our prerogative to do that. 
We've got to be humble enough to just be thankful that we get into the kingdom with our own faults. But we do know there are some very wonderful people in this world. Now, I've met them all over the world. They are wonderful people. And we know that. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to sing this hymn to finish. Uh, and I've sele selected it because, not, not because it's, not, it's, a, it's a common one, but, but because, brothers and sisters, we know it so well. But I've selected it because I want us to sing this now when we, to close this day, not as a hymn, but as a prayer. Because it certainly expresses my hope, and I'm certain it expresses yours.